from the nation's capital, this is the Fly Fishing Consultant Podcast with your host, Rob Snowett. downloading the fly fishing consultant podcast i am your host rob snow white this is series one episode 91 a bucket list of places styles methods and locations that i've always wanted to fish and the variety of species found there this is my bucket list podcast i want to give a shout out to those who have helped support the podcast in the last couple of weeks shout out to snakehead fred for his ordering of custom flies and john and garrett hauser as well for your purchase of flies purchasing just a few flies from me will help fund this podcast it costs 15 bucks a month to host online so if you'd like to buy some flies and help me out that would be much appreciated so let's talk about the bucket list i'm not a world traveler I've got responsibilities at home, and I don't have a big budget for fishing. I just ask you to buy flies to help fund this. I don't get to fish far off in exotic places. Not that what I'm going to list are extremely remote or off the beaten path. And frankly, today is November 1, rabbit, rabbit, rabbit. I have not gone fishing. I went fishing once. I went and walked along the canal in Georgetown looking for carp one day. But I've not caught a fish since I was in Colorado. Now, granted, I have hooked some fish while showing my clients how and where to cast, but I have not gone out on my my own in pursuit of fish. So I would like to go to these places and fish. I want some pristine waters and litter-free banks or shorelines. I would like to fish without seeing anyone else. When I do have the opportunity to fish somewhere else, it's most likely part of a family trip, not a fishing trip. So the trips to Colorado, the trips to Ohio, family trips to Orlando, these are not purely fishing trips. These are family trips where I get to fish on the side. You're not going to see pictures of me in distant locations doing grip and grins with exotic species. You don't see pictures of me really at all. If you want to know what I look like, I'm 5'11", around 170, I have uh, what some refer to as a Jufro. My hair gets very thick and bushy. I've got green eyes, but I always wear sunglasses, so you're never going to see those. And the chip in my tooth got fixed recently, so my smile's a little bit better. For me, this fly fishing consultant endeavor for the last seven, eight, nine years isn't really about me. It's about the students, the clients, or you, the listeners. I'm the guy behind the scenes. I don't get much glory. I'm not looking for it. I don't seek it. Other than receiving emails from you, the listeners, or texts, Facebook messages, tweets, other social media interactions where I hear your success stories, that the fly you bought for me caught a fish, or the technique I explained, or a species of fish I described helped you go out and become a better angler. That's why I'm sitting here behind a microphone. I could be out today fishing, but I'd rather be here doing this, educating other people. One day, I would like to turn this podcast and all podcasts in general into some kind of educational like PBS TV series where I go around and do an entomology one, a reading water, break down different species, what fish eat, uh, do one on steelhead, salmon, trout, carp, bonefish, striped bass, and have an educational series. Maybe one day it could be something for Netflix. I don't know. but There's no budget. There's no TV crew. Uh, it's just not something that's happened. But yet, better yet, I'd like to be a, a fly fishing professor of sorts. And I could have a classroom where each one of these would be a different lecture and students would come in maybe two days a week for lecture and we'd have a four hour lab once a week where we could actually go out and get dirty in the creeks and flip over rocks and just sit and watch bugs coming off and just learn about fly fishing. I'd like to get back to my corduroy sport coats, pens in my shirt pocket, laser pointer in my hand, maybe wearing a lab coat, 
being up in front of people, doing what I do best, which is just talking because I don't really stop talking ever. Holt's driving up next week for the road trip, and he insists on driving, so hopefully I fall asleep and I don't bother him too much. Uh, I think we're going to have some DVDs playing. Probably we're going to watch episode four through seven of Star Wars, if all goes well. You know, they do say once a teacher, always a teacher, and it's kind of what I'm doing now. We would also would say when I was a teacher or an educator that I teach, we teach, you teach. So thus, I hope you share some of this knowledge from the podcast and other things you've learned from me with others over the years. And if I get hit by a bus tomorrow, maybe my daughter can listen to these podcasts and learn that her dad wasn't just a total fly fishing nerd, but he actually you know, enjoyed it and was passionate about it. Frankly, it's the only thing I'm good at. I'm not really good at much else. So I teach you or my daughter – And then we teach where you're explaining to me what you're learning and sharing your knowledge. And then you teach someone else, which is what I hope some of the listeners like uh, John is doing with his son Garrett. And for now, I'm staying put here in the D.C. metro area, the hustle and bustle of Metropolis. I've got to go run some errands today. I'm only going about six miles, but it's going to take plenty of time. There's a... Probably 20 traffic lights between here and the store I need to get to. So this bucket list is not directed to catch a specific species. I'm not interested in the glory of monster fish that take hours to land. No 100-pound tarpons, no potato cods, no billfish. It's the plants and animals I want to see in the pristine locations. The abundance of fish and the experience of just being there and seeing the fish might be enough for me. I wouldn't mind... If we had benches along the Potomac where I could just sit and watch the Shad run, there's the benches along the Latort in Pennsylvania. I think we should have benches along Mossy Creek. I, I could be happy just watching you know, a pot of bright red with green head sockeye salmon swimming up river. I don't have to specifically catch these fish. I just want to see them. That'd be a, quite enough for me. Now, the location as the backdrop for the fish would definitely help. I want rum drinks with umbrellas. I want to eat fried and mashed plantains. I want cold lager beer. I want fried good bar food at different places where I'm going to travel. I want to travel maybe so I can find the best coconut curry or some kind of rich stew that a grandma's making in a shack along a beach. I don't want to spend my time away, um, you know, eating exotic foods and ending up on the toilet so i want to play it safe um you know nothing too sketchy looking for me i'm no uh, andrew zimmer or anthony bourdain but i do want to go to places with solid safe food great wine big steaks homemade um, you know like grandma made food i want rich cocktails i want pebbles on the beach i don't want sand and there's definitely not gonna be any cilantro I will carry a card with me written in every language possible that says no cilantro, and I'll hand it to the wait staff. Now, I did this when I was a teacher. I had all my students write down no cilantro, please. And I actually got one lady get offended because I didn't have her language. It was a Vietnamese restaurant. So um, I'm going to have to get the full list of all these places and their languages. Now, several of these places I've read about since I was a kid. Maybe it was a location I saw on a Saturday morning fishing show like Walker's K Chronicles, Fly Fish America, which was one of my favorites, Fly Fishing the World, and those short five-minute segments of Larry Dahlberg, Hunt for Big Fish, before it became a full series. A lot of these places are spots I've already been to and may not have been prepared for the first time. But knowing what I know now, I can be more prepared and more successful I could go to these places I visited as a kid or when I didn't have a fly rod and I want to take the family with me now and I want to be successful in these spots and who knows, maybe I'll find somewhere awesome to stay and my wife and I can open up maybe a a bed and breakfast. In my years, I have developed a passion for wanting to fish slow flowing rivers, frigid tailwaters plunging down a mountain canyon with large boulders. 
I want slow, meandering valley streams. I want boulder-strewn shorelines where fish can be hiding. I want to fish the edges of mangroves. I want turquoise lagoons. I want, I want warmth. I want sunshine. I want to wear my big hat again and, and walk some flats or maybe being pulled by someone in a flats boat. So I've tried to compile this list. It's been a mental list that I've been going strong with, I could say, since I was four years old and fishing with my grandma's neighbor named Lenny down in Florida. And the species I want to target, I want I want to land a bonefish. Never done that. I've never landed a tarpon. I want a baby tarpon. I want a 40-pounder. I don't want a big tarpon. I want a small snook. I want those exotic Amazonian catfish with the red barbels that have shown up in Florida. I want to go up to Alaska and catch northern pike. I want to catch a grayling. I've never seen a grayling. I've never seen a wild peacock bass. I've never seen a wild coho or chinook salmon. I've never seen a chum salmon. I've never seen a wild Pacific steelhead or a Dolly Varden. I want to catch a Garibaldi. So I'm going to go through my list now and break it down of places I've always wanted to go. And there are so many places that just aren't in here because I just sat down with my phone when I'm between clients or something popped in my head over the last several months. This is an incomplete list. And hopefully one day I can do part two of other places and I can tell you about the ones I've crossed off. And before I get this going, I just want to tell you, it is not okay to rest your fly rod over your shoulders for grip and grins for the people that do go to the exotic locations. That's just terrible. Absolutely terrible. So now I'm going to sit here with my black nose dace in my aquarium. And we're going to read you a big list. Alaska. Alaska has been on my bucket list probably since the first time I started reading fly fishing magazines. You know, I didn't grow up with the internet. I didn't grow up with TV. Uh, we had books in the library and magazines out, up at Safeway. And I would get in trouble for going up to Safeway and just taking out Field and Stream and Sporting Journal and whatever else, getting Cabela's catalogs and Bass Pro and seeing pictures. And Alaska might be number one. I want to go there and just see what wildlife used to be in places that it's still just untouched by people. I want to see the massive runs of fish in clear water. I want to see tide pools along the coast with giant anemones and crabs and kelp. I want to find out what it's like to hook into a wild Alaskan salmon in the middle of nowhere where we are the only ones fishing. I've been hearing about it. I see people do it. I've been offered jobs in Alaska, but they came too late in my career. When I was a freshman in college, I had a fly fishing magazine and I wrote letters to every lodge in Alaska looking for work, doing anything. And that was over 20, geez, 22 years ago, maybe now, 21 years ago. And back then I would have loved to have moved to Alaska and guided, but life's different now. And, and it looks like this might just be a place I get a visit, hopefully my wife has travel there at some point, or I can save up for a birthday trip, something that Tom and I have talked about doing for 17 years now, and neither of us have been. I could go on talking about why I want to fish Alaska, but just know um, Alaska's it. I want to catch these Dolly Varden that people complain about, uh, that they, you know, they're trying to fish for salmon and the, the dollies are above them and they're catching these brilliantly covered dollies that are enormous right in front of them. I want to catch these giant rainbows that are eating the eggs behind the salmon. It just, it's fascinated me for a long time and it's on the bucket list and further out. I want to get to the Aleutian islands off Alaska reading Island of the blue dolphin. That's what I want to, and that inspired me when I was in sixth grade to go out there. I've seen um, Jeff Corwin go out there and just absolutely just destroy fish. He was surrounded by them. And maybe I would even eat a salmon out there. Who knows? I want to head back to the Amazon. When I was in the Amazon in high school, it was blown out and flooded. Uh, 
I didn't have any fishing gear with me. I used uh, Steve Sclarou's stuff, and it, it, the river went up 15 feet. The tributary we were on went up 15 feet in the couple of days we were there. So the one day we did go out on the river, we, we never even found clear water. The guys who worked at the lodge were taking these giant hooks. They just looked like bent nails. And they were explaining how they just put a chunk of meat on there and throw it out with rope. And they were you know, opening their arms like this big to show that's what they catch. Don't know what was in there. Probably never will. But I, I want to go back. I want to catch all these crazy exotic species. Um, there's so many different members of the catfish family that live down there. Catfish on the fly are just, they're awesome. They're such strong fish. And there are more catfish in the Amazon basin than anywhere else in the world. I want to go to one of those fish markets in Brazil where you just see these varieties of fruits and fish that come out of the jungles that most people have never seen before. I would love to get up there and do dugout canoe trips and, and float and go back into the canopies during the rainy season and see what I could catch on fruit and seed patterns versus, you know, I'll probably just take clousers and catch plenty of fish. But I, I grew up obsessed with the canopy of the rainforest and didn't really pay too much attention to what was below in the water. And I'd like to get down there and, and see some of the fish. It'd be really cool. I want to go to Argentina. I want to have big steaks and big red wines and I want to fish these waters that I first saw in the Trout Bum Diaries when they went to South America. And it just blew me away that these fish probably had never even seen a human before. They were stocked for ranchers and people over 100 years ago, and they keep reproducing. I want to see llamas and vicuñas and, and wild flamingos out there. And, um, you know, maybe even a, uh, an, you know, emus running around. Or Rias. Emus are Australian, right? It's the Ria Darwini, is the South American large bird. Kind of go, go walk where you know Darwin did after his trip down there when he wrote The Voyage of the Beagle. Fascinating book if you've never read it. It's pretty cool. I want to fish all these spring waters and rivers out there that are just in the middle of nowhere, but have had developed um, you know, an industry around them. Over, I don't know, since since those trout were fished. I don't know. I just want to get down there. I want to get to the Black Canyon of the Gunnison. I've never fished there. I've driven, driven over it. I've only been down that way in Colorado twice. Once was stopping at I think the National Park or State Park at the Black Canyon of the Gunnison. And then when I went down there to visit my friend Ben in 2005, I believe, Christmas break. Where we fish the Taylor. Never fish the Gunnison, though. I want to get back there and do that. I want those big salmon flies coming off the walls. I want to see those little weaselly looking animals that crawl up along the edges. I don't really want to hike down there or hike out, but I want to fish it. And I don't know if that's above or below the tailwater, but there was a massive tailwater down there I drove by in 94 that I would love to go back and fish. I've never been to Big Sur in California. When my brother and I drove cross country 20 years ago, he wanted to take the fast route down five from Portland. I wanted to take the coast, but he was in a hurry and I've never been back out there. The farthest north I've been was that trip to California five years ago where I fished Malibu. I haven't really seen the, the coast along California ever. Never seen the big redwoods. I would love to go and and fish along the shorelines there. My brother did go there once and had a mountain lion jump out of a tree in front of him and his girlfriend. So that might be the reason why we didn't go back, but it's, it's not going to stop me. He blames that incident for him losing his crazy Creek chair. I want to do back country, central American, Caribbean, Floridian trips for baby tarpon and snook. And that crystal clear water along the edge of the mangroves where all the, the uh, tur two, what are they called? Tourniquet, sea squirts, and all the other filter feeders filter that water right at the edge of the mangroves where they're living on, on the root balls and the root nodules. And 
And the water so clear right along that edge because it's constantly being filtered. And you can see everything so clearly. And I would love to get in there with a mask and snorkel and swim around and looking at all that stuff again. I haven't been along mangroves with a mask and snorkel since my tropical ecology class to Puerto Rico. And um, it was awesome, except for the day that I got hit by like a rogue wave and was rolled up onto a coral reef. My bathing suit was shredded, and I got all sorts of stings from the, the coral animals. That was not pleasant. And I don't, like I said, I don't want big tarpon. I want I want little ones. I'd rather catch a couple little ones and spend you know, 10, 15 minutes fighting them than wasting all day on a huge one where I'm just going to be exhausted. I just don't have the energy for that. I'd rather get little ones. I'd rather just go to tar- uh, Robbie's, drink a cold beer, and look down at the tarpon that are the size of me. I do not want to catch one. I have no interest in doing that. I mentioned my trip to Colorado in 94. We drove from Fort Collins to Denver and then towards Buena Vista and then the sand dunes. And then it was all four wheel drive roads for two days over to Silverton. And I had a five and a seven weight with me and had never fished out West. I didn't really know what to bring with me. Didn't, didn't know how to tie leaders. Um, didn't really have the budget for buying leaders. I was going to be a senior in high school and had only the money I'd earned working the summer before at Reston Day Camp or selling pool passes in Reston. So I um, wasn't really prepared, but we were driving. And as a fisherman, I knew fishy spots. We were going up over these mountains where we're starting at the bottom and getting elevation in this land cruiser and it's just beaver pond and then you go up you know five feet and there's another beaver pond and it just keeps going up and you can see fish rising in them and i don't think anybody fishes them and we're in the middle of nowhere and i if you gave me the topo maps of colorado i don't think i ever would find these spots again and we eventually came out on the animus river above silverton so i have a general idea i remember getting out and taking pictures of marmots up there and we could see the forest fires way far up north. That was the year the, the 14 firefighters died. And it was also the same year my wife was out there doing Outward Bound. It was kind of serendipitous. We were out there at the same time. Of course, we never ran into each other. I want to go back to those beaver ponds. And I want to camp out there and just slowly move you know, up in elevation or start at the top and move down and just fish all these spots. I can close my eyes and see the aspens and the pines and the columbines and Indian paintbrush and just the sound of the water trickling down. There was no air conditioning. There was no radio. We just had the sound of the wind and the birds. And it was one of the greatest summers I ever had. I want to fish a bamboo forest somewhere in maybe Southeast Asia, like the one in Crouching Tiger Hidden Dragon. I just want to see a forest of bamboos. I hate the ones in my backyard. I want to get rid of them. I can't fish in my backyard, but I would love to see just all that bright green vertical grasses growing and fishing along a river somewhere where you just have that really cool ecosystem. I don't know what I would find in there, but again, it's the place that I want to fish, not necessarily the species I want to catch. I want to get back to Australia. I've never done New Zealand and I want to fish tree fern forests. I got to see those tree ferns only at the um, garden park in Canberra, but I never got a fish really anywhere other than Burley Griffin. And like I said, it was a family trip. It wasn't fishing. And New Zealand has always been on my list since a fly fisherman magazine in 94. And it's the bluest water I'd ever seen photographed at the time. And the guy had a cowboy hat on and there was this big, tussle of grass and the guy was leaning back into it with his hands behind his head with his cowboy hat tilted over his eyes and he was taking a nap and I was in AP biology and I was reading it during like a break or something and somebody walked by and was like is that you if not that should be you and it stuck in my mind ever since and if you've got an old magazine from back then it can find that picture I had it it was in my parents basement I had all these magazines for years 
and my parents tossed them. I was able to cut out a couple of pictures and articles. Those are long gone. I wanted to fish that crystal clear water. You have one or two trout per hole, and you got to crouch down, and you're really stocking fish. It's like stocking fish here in the national park. But the fish are bigger, and they're browns, and there's some rainbows, and I've always wanted to do that, and I'm telling you about it now. I want to fish a big flat for cruising carp. I, I wish we had more spots like that out here. We just don't. Four-mile run looks like the carpiest spot around. Maybe now that there's aquatic vegetation coming in, there's hydrilla and some uh, elodea, maybe they'll get more biodiversity in there and the carp will start coming up onto the flats and feeding. But I was just enamored with my trip to Colorado this summer and the trip to Ohio where I could sight cast to these just pigs feeding you know, they're so into feeding that they didn't even know I was there. I don't know if I want to do, you know, Beaver Island seems to be on everyone's list. That sounds awesome. I, I, I've i been offered trips up there, but the timing and budget are never right. I, I wish I could get out to the Shenandoah and fish for carp out there. Tom and I would talk about that in the 90s and never did it. I live out here on Burke Lake and I don't get out there and fish. It's, it's a lot of just time. I don't have things, you know, it doesn't fit in my schedule. I want I want big carp in clear water where they're tailing and I pick the right fly and set it at that right time and the fight's on. Because those carp in Colorado didn't fight for squat. I want to get back to bioluminescent water. I haven't seen bioluminescent water in about 10 years when we were all skinny dipping at night in Ocean City in Maryland. Not the best idea. But bioluminescent water, if you've never experienced it, they're diatoms. They have dino or dio, dinoflagella, I should say. They're two flagella. One goes round and round. One's on top of the head. And they have a chemical reaction of an enzyme called luciferase, which makes them emit light. It's bioluminescent. It's life light. And these diatoms will sacrifice themselves by lighting themselves up to to get not altruism because they're dying, but they'll sacrifice their life for the other diatoms around them. So they will light up and get eaten to save the other ones. And I've fished bioluminescent water in the Florida Keys. And when your fly hits, the water sparkles. And when you strip it through the water, it sparkles. And when we scared tarpon next to the boat, the water was black. And all of a sudden, it would just be electric green for a split second, and you'd see this outline of a fish take off, and then the swirls left behind, those little eddies would be swirling with glowing water. It's one of the coolest things you can ever experience. I've seen it, like I said, in the Keys. Um, it was Bioluminescent Bay in Puerto Rico where you know, my girlfriend and I were just doing like backflips and cannonballs off the boat at night, and you'd fill your mouth with water and spit it in the air, and there'd be a glowing stream or you could spit it on the boat and the boat would be twinkling. It's just, it's crazy. It's one of those things you have to see. In Ocean City, the waves were crashing and the sand would be glittering. It's one of the coolest things you can see in nature. Um, and I want to get back. I want to see something like that again. Not even to fish it, but to jump around in it and splash and and show my daughter. You know, There's some pretty cool stuff out there in nature. You can't make this stuff up. I had a friend in high school do a canoe trip to the Boundary Waters in Minnesota. Correct me if I'm wrong. I didn't do my research on this. I just made lists. And her description of the smallmouth bass up there and just canoeing and portaging for days and being the only ones out there, that stuck in my mind. And she told me I need to get there, and I haven't been there yet. It's on my bucket list. We're planning on a big road trip next summer with an RV so maybe we can strap the beater canoe to the roof and we can head up that way but I, I want a big smallmouth I'm not a big smallmouth fisherman here like big as in I don't fish a lot for them they're not really where I fish I want to get up there and fish poppers and reapers and all these flies I tie up my snallygasters and scorpion bugs and my frogs and I just want to catch big bronze backs 
It's, I've caught maybe three huge or large smallmouth in my life, and those would be laughed at up there. Absolutely laughed at. And closed up there is Canada. Canada offers such a wide variety of fishing. I want to start on the West Coast and head east. And I've got these spots broken down. We used to have some Canadian TV fishing show where these guys were just fishing for muskie and pike and smallmouth all the time. And nothing they caught was small. It was all a, a huge fight and it was consistent. Places that people just don't fish. They're not pressured fish. Spots that Lee Wolf used to fly into on his, his uh, float plane. That sounds just like awesome, awesome fishing to me. All over Canada. I want to head up to Montauk and fish with Paul Dixon. He invited me up there and right around the millennium to go fishing with him for those just schools of stripers. And I've seen videos. We played them at the shop. I see them from the groups at Somerset in the hallway. What would it be like to be able to cast that many stripers? I don't want bluefish. Bluefish are nuts. They're, they're not right in the head. They're like the North Atlantic version of the Barracuda. I don't really want to deal with them. I think a striper might be the prettiest fish. I've always said if I'm going to get a tattoo, it would be striped bass scales down my forearm. And you just look at that silvery white and black, and to me, it's just the perfect fish. Um, I've never caught anything bigger than 22 inches. I would like to find out what it's like to catch like a 30-inch striper off on a, a boat or off the beach or a jetty. I've had the opportunities. I've seen some, but it's never come to fruition. In some places, I really, really want to get to and soon. I want to fish Cheeseman Canyon. We got super close over the summer. I've been reading about it and hearing about it for years when I worked in Breck. The guys in the shop would always talk about it. I didn't know where it was, didn't know how to fish it. It just never really came up. I fished the Dream in the Blue and the uh, the Colorado mostly. So I never really made it down there. And I think I'm going to do a, a road trip out, fly out to fish with Justin again. And he's going to take me up there because it's not far from him. He knows what he's doing up there. I want to fish crystal clear waters in Florida. Not too particular. There used to be, was it Dr. Bass on Saturday mornings? And there was one where he went snorkeling with an underwater camera in this water where you can see like 60 feet out in front of you and up and down and all around. And I guess just spring fed water, like with manatees. I would love to take the canoe in the backwoods out there or the drift boat and just. Yeah, I don't get to see fish that often. When we're fishing the sewage outflow, that's it. But I would like to go out where I'm not instructing and I'm not working and I'm having fun for myself fishing in that crystal clear water. And I believe they're mostly on the west coast of Florida. And our neighbors went to one, not our neighbors, uh, my kid's former classmate. They moved out to California. But they went to one of the rivers, the Suwannee, I believe, where the sturgeon were jumping in the air. That would be something cool to see. I've seen sturgeon in tanks, never in the wild. I think seeing a sturgeon in the wild would be pretty darn cool. Don't really want to catch a sturgeon, but I'd like to see one. I want to get down to the dry Tortugas. I want to camp out on that big old bunker building down there and and go out on the flats. I think that's where the famous Val Atkinson picture of the guy casting on the sunken airplane was taken. Don't know too much about the Tortugas, but I, you know, I read about it when I was younger and the Saturday morning shows. I think Dry Tortugas is just a cool name. And I could hit all those spots in the Keys that my wife wants to go eat at and drink at and sightsee. She's never been south of... I want to say Isla Mirada or no, be Hionda. That was the farthest south that south we have been together. I'm talking like her family saying south because the Russians, they can't pronounce their THs, north, south. 
I would like to get back down there. I just want to do the whole Keys again slowly. I want to see the Keys that people don't get to, the back country. I want to feel that warm sunshine. I want to see the frigid birds and the spoonbills and the ibises. I'm kind of obsessed with Florida. Florida and Alaska would be the two places that I would like to go to. And notice I'm not saying like the Seychelles or Southeast India. There's no Mongolia on this list. There's no Kamchatka. Uh, I want to go to Italy to eat. I want to go to Bavaria to eat, but you know, maybe Slovenia. But these are there's they're not on my list. Kola Peninsula not on my list. There's I don't want to do the super exotic, crazy far off places. Uh, again, Florida Everglades. I want to camp on those elevated platforms and just go explore. And I would need a GPS and a crumb line and and have to bring uh, surveying tape to tie up to trees because I would get so backwards out there. I, I've never really been back in the Everglades when I was in second or third second grade. We took the auto train to Florida. And we drove across the Everglades and did the airboat rides. I got my brother got bit by a bird down there. It was pretty funny. Not for him, but I thought it was hilarious. And I just remember seeing all these tannic stained waters and just thinking, damn, I want to fish here so bad. And I think we went over that in one of the earliest podcasts it's about fly fishermen. I wasn't a fly fisherman then, but it was it was burgeoning in me. Now, when you drive over any stream or creek, you got to lift your head up and look down. That's why I want to get a bigger SUV so I can look at more bodies of water. We, it's, it's inherent that we have to look at those. And when I was seven or eight years old, seven years old, it was spring break. I wasn't eight yet. That's all I could think about was, was all that water. And at the gift shop where we got on the boats, just thinking, my goodness, there must be some big fish in here. And I know there are, and I, I want to get them. Definitely have to bring mosquito nets and all sorts of stuff because I despise mosquitoes. I will wear car hearts down there if I can keep the mosquitoes from biting through me. I want to get on a flats boat for redfish. I've done flats boats for you know stuff out here on the Potomac. I've done them in the Keys, but redfish was never the target. I do not like that Spartina grass. That stuff was super sharp, and my wife threw out my flats boots, so I kept getting snails in my feet and breaking them and cutting myself, cutting my hands when I try to scrape them out of the shoes. I want to be up on a boat casting into that grass. Um, There's a lot of Instagram accounts I follow down in the low country, and it just looks like a beautiful way to fish. And I remember... um, watching uh, Paula Shear at the IF4 trailer being on the the paddleboard and hooking into these fish. And I was like, damn, that just looks really freaking cool. A paddleboard would be pretty cool too. I'd probably fall off a paddleboard, but I'm willing to give it a shot. As long as I don't have to walk through that sharp stuff anymore. I want to uh, – Florida's next, but I'm, I'm just going to be going through all of Florida. I want to get back to the Galapagos and fish. Uh, we had a five weight with floating line and some clousers. I never even knew what a clouser was at the time. And this guy had the, you know, Steve Sclaru had these flies and we kept losing them to the puffer fish that break them in half. But I want to go back and, and fish all these spots where just frigid, cold, deep blue water with just all sorts of bizarre fish swimming around. You can find some warm volcanic vents and you get some different species around there. But I didn't have any gear and I, I really want to get back there. Uh, that was part of my obsession growing up was the Galapagos. One of the plans after college was to move down there and it'd be a tropical ecologist. And it fell through like so many of these other great opportunities that seem to have come my way that just haven't happened. We had the Galapagos. And and I'd be very sad to see how much it's changed since I've been there. I was shocked that we were going to discotheques and there were soccer stadiums and people growing coffee with just goats and chickens and pigs and cattle roaming free around all of that 
once in a lifetime biodiversity that that's not going to come around again. Places like that are are done, and we're not going to find more of them that haven't been touched by man. So uh, yeah, it was pretty shameful. I didn't like that. When I was obsessed with a TV show called uh, Trail something trail make your own adventure and it was sponsored by ll bean and they did a canoe backwards trip through the gulf coast maybe louisiana and it was all these just big old cypress trees and they're hanging up there's no dry land to camp on they're hanging up these hammocks that were tents and i had never seen one of those at the time so i was absolutely fascinated and they cooked and did everything up in the treetops now, I'm not one of those guys that wants to hang in one of those ledges off like El Capitan. That's just crazy. But five feet above the water is fine with me as long as a gator can't jump up and get me and, uh, and the water snakes don't want to mess with me. I'm fine with a brown water snake up here. I've never seen a water moccasin. I've seen pictures of them. They scare the socks off me. I want to do high desert steelhead out west. I've driven out towards the Dales. I've never been to Bend. Um, yeah, we we want to move out there. Just sounds like an awesome place. But yeah, I want to do high alpine, the spots that Brian Chow fishes. I see him posting pictures on. That sounds really cool to me. And the fact that these steelhead, with all those dams, which need to be taken out and destroyed and be gone with, that they can get all the way up there and back year after year. Maybe I don't really want to harass a fish, though, that's been doing that. But, damn, I want to catch one. I think that would be nuts. Just in, in that um, in that environment, just different environment. I'm used to Great Lakes, over cloud, overcast, cloudy, rainy, snowy drizzle. What would it be like to have, like, a warm day up there? I couldn't imagine a warm day fishing for steelhead. I'm going to pause real quick. Someone's calling me. Those damn telemarketers. If you work for the company that calls all the time and says, you have been chosen for a cruise, punch yourself in the face and then go fishing or or something to make yourself feel better. But yeah, you guys are the worst. I get like two calls a day from those. And I don't know. This was from Biloxi, Mississippi. I don't know if it's a client in town with a cell phone from a different location or someone coming to town or whatever. Or someone calling to ask questions. I always have to answer these calls politely as a business that owner. And I get so pissed off because four out of five, it's a junk call. And it just pisses me off. It's a waste of my time. I'm on the do not to call registry. It doesn't work. All right. Back to Steelhead. I want to start up maybe Montreal and work all my way over. I want to do the entire rust belt with steelhead get my steelhead crew get holt get stankus get jason get thomas we're gonna throw art in the car we're gonna get uh tom and i think we'll have justin come out here we're gonna get the steelhead crew and davenport's gonna have to suck up the cold and go with us and uh we're gonna do the entire great lakes i want to find out about all these streams that art talks about that have random fish that have swum up into them. I want to fish the entire Great Lakes system. I, I still haven't read the uh, the book on fishing the inland oceans, but I want to. And I want to just take off like a whole winter. Have the kid take school classes online in, a, in an RV or something. And we'll just go out and just steelhead fish every day and come back at night and tie flies and Go out for some chili and cornbread and some home cooked warm meal along the rivers. A Trader Joe's used to make chicken stew in a can that was almost on par with my grandma's. This stuff was legit. And I loved eating that up on the rivers. They don't make it anymore. It was a big can, like a uh, coffee can size. I mean, it fed four, but I would eat the whole thing at once. Because remember, you have to fuel your internal furnace to keep you warm on the river. So this is The Treasury of Angling by Larry Kohler. I used to go to the used bookstores all the time. And uh, I bought this one. 
at some point growing up, I had to have had a driver's license. I probably could have walked there. I love I love the old photos in this book, but here it is. Golden Trout, page 144. Golden Trout Lakes lie like jewels in high country, left. The horse is required transportation and can assist the fishermen. So it's two dudes on horseback. One horse is up to its, I guess, knees. The other one's up to, I mean, its tail's all the way in the water. The guy's feet are almost wet. The guy on the left has a fish on. It's a short bamboo rod. His line's tight, and the other guy has got one on too. I've always wanted to fish high alpine lakes on horseback because of this picture. Um, And I can flip through this book, and I mean, there's so many just crazy salmon and steelhead anglers from the past. They're all holding the fish, you know, with their fingers up in the gills. Um, Man, I love this book. And I sit in my blue crushed velvet chair in the laundry room, and I still flip through this book all the freaking time. Um, I think I'll take a picture of this, and I'll put it on Instagram. There we go. High Alpine Lakes. I, I never really got to fish a lot of the High Alpine Lakes in Colorado. The ones I did were mostly around Silverton and on the way to Uray. Uh, mostly brook trout up there. But I, I, you know, I, I never really got to the super high elevation ones that people hike to. But then again, I would have to take a horse because I don't like hiking at all. Um, bucket list. Been a long time. We didn't get to talk too much with Max about my bucket list of wanting to go to Iceland. But the price of it sounds a little difficult now. Maybe I can go to that hotel and catch me a cod. Iceland has been intriguing to me for a very long time, mostly just because of the barrenness of Iceland. I don't think I have to worry about trees on my back cast for one, Um, but that there's these native browns and the salmons that have been there for eons and that they swim up these crazy looking rivers with all this just awesome geologic structures around them. And I can sit there and look at rocks all day too. Don't get me wrong. Uh, yeah, I think Iceland would be fascinating. I think I'd have difficulty with the food. Hot dogs would probably be the thing. I don't want to eat that fermented shark. Uh, my friend uh, Kristen's been living there for a while going to school. So maybe we can go visit her. But the wife wants to go badly. And I think we'll take the kid too. Um, we're not taking the kid I think to Asheville, we're planning on doing the Western North Carolina fly fishing show again, first weekend of December. Uh, But I think we're going to leave the kid here so we can go out and enjoy some food. And my wife can do a, uh, a, you know, beer tour down there and hit all the places we couldn't last year. I want to fish more around Asheville too. Damn, that place was nuts. All right, let's see on my list. Kauai. Kauai was our honeymoon location. You've heard this on the podcast, I'm sure, many times, that we took a panga or zodiac around the island, um, up the Nepali coast. The water was like, I mean, as flat as toilet water. It was so calm. Like, I was on the the bow of the boat, and there was a dolphin, and I I took a picture perfectly looking down its blowhole. Like, it was that clear that I could focus in its blowhole. And I've got four rods with me, because my wife is cool. She lets me fish on these trips and I'm getting ready to jump on with, uh, you know, day pack and my rods and, and the captain dude's like, Oh, there's no room for that here. And and there's no room. There's no room on the boat for your gear. There's not going to be any time to fish where we're going. There's no fish. This is why I've said before, you don't trust non anglers for this kind of information. Uh, Granted, the guy had some cool stories and took us around the Island. We had an awesome time, but I'm still bitter about this. Max and I had a huge conversation, I think, off air about having no regrets in life. And I regret not being able to take my rods. We get to the spot and we drop, uh, we hook up to like an anchored buoy and we're snorkeling and these trigger fish. Now take your arms, pretend you are hugging a giant sequoia tree and your fingers. Imagine from what's happening when mama is hugging um, Roger and he's like, but mama, I can't breathe. That kind of a hug. That's how big these trigger fish were. They were 
bigger than trash can lids. And these things would come up and eat tomatoes off the surface, potato chips, whatever you didn't want from your lunch, you could throw in there and they would eat it. And I'm just sitting there thinking, just one. All I need to do is catch one of these and I would be completely satisfied to see this fish up close. Never caught a trigger fish on the fly. And these were just freaking, they were they were like blackish, kind of an oily blue color, green to them with these big beaks. And then my wife is snorkeling and I'm throwing food at her and these trigger fish are like jumping over her to eat that. And she just reached up from the water and gave me the bird and went back under. And I just found the um, waterproof disposable cameras in storage that have never been developed from that trip. So I think I might have to go to, I don't even get those developed anymore. But I want to see what's on them. And I wouldn't mind just going around the island in general doing more fishing. Um, I, I really want to catch a Hawaiian bonefish. I want to go back to Hawaii because I love the food. I love the, the, the culture. I think it's. It's amazing how they've maintained, you know, a lot of the Hawaiian culture with all of the, you know, I, I wrote a paper in college said, don't Hawaii the Galapagos. And it has to do with how the tourism industry has just completely changed the islands and it's been so built up, but it still has in some places off the beaten path where the tours don't go. I want to see some more of that. I want some more traditional cooking, um, you know, what you think of Hawaiian just isn't, which is amazing to us. I want to see the real, like the stuff I read about in Missioner and, and the historical stuff. It's the world's most isolated island chain. And things out there aren't found anywhere else until, you know, we started bringing things there and destroying it all. Um, I wanted to move there and work for the park service after college. That was one of my plans, uh, I think, junior year. I had started planning on doing that. It just wasn't feasible. And I don't think my parents wanted me that far away after college. But that was one of my plans as a, you know, as a biology student was to go out there and like work on the invasive pig programs, um, help people track and shoot the wild pigs. I thought that'd be a pretty damn cool job. Local stuff, Mallows Bay. That's like what? 20 miles from here. Never been there. It's the, this hemisphere's largest shipwreck graveyard site. It got a lot of popularity recently that it's going to become like a national historic place through one of Obama's, um, I don't know what laws he's passing, whatever, but I want to head out there. Just look up Mallows Bay, M-A-L-L-O-W-S. I didn't even know this place existed until Holt told me about it two years ago. Two years. I've lived in this zip code my entire life. Didn't know that was right across the river. I want to take the drift boat there. Why I haven't done it, I don't know. But I want to. I want to fish the Ozarks. I want to go fishing with Dave Whitlock. I want to give that guy just a big hug and sit back with him on a porch and, and drink a lemonade and just, just talk. That man is such a wealth of information. And I would love to go fishing with him. I think that would be just a really honorable thing to be able to do is fish with Dave Whitlock. I hope he's at Somerset again this year because I just want to hang out with him when I'm not tired. I just want to sit down and talk to the guy. I've been an admirer of him since I started fishing with the fly and reading about him. And when I go into fly shops and I see one of the signature of like his you know, fox squirrel nymph, I'm like, holy crap, that thing was in Dave Whitlock's hands. It's not just, I mean, the man's a writer, a fly tire. Um, he developed the whole system for how trout are out there on below those um, tailwaters in Missouri, in Arkansas. And damn, if that just wouldn't be one of the coolest things to do, I think that would be a lot of fun. Want to go fish in English Chalk Stream, where, where it all started. I mean, I know fly fishing started like in Mesopotamia and other things with, you know, bone hooks and, and handmade twine. But where fly fishing as we know it, where it really started, I want to go to the English chalk streams where it's traditional. I remember seeing, um, oh, it was a World War II movie where the little boy 
goes to live with his grandparents. He steals a peach from the neighbor's yard. And a German bomber drops a bomb into this chalk stream. And all these trout rise up. And all the women who are not at war, they all go out and they start collecting these fish and putting them in baskets, taking them home. And there's willow trees. I just think that's awesome. I once saw a Jamie Oliver episode where he went fishing, caught a big brown trout. They took it home and ate it. I would love to fish an English chalk stream with my wellies and some tweed, a nice warm sweater, having some tea before and after fishing. That sounds cool to me. And I think y'all would agree that you want to do that too. I mentioned uh, Pacific Coast. I want to fish the kelp forests off of Monterey. I want to go to the aquarium again. I want to get locked in there overnight and just sit and watch the, the jellies and the tuna in the tank and the otters. I want to take an otter home with me. I want to see otter for a pet. I want to fish a kelp bed where there's all sorts of just crazy stuff down there that I can hook. Stuff that I've, you know, the Garibaldi's, uh, yellow tails, I, rock bass. I'm not too familiar with the Western fish. But I know they're out there, and and I want to catch them. And then my wife and I can go back to shore, and she can get fish tacos at some some shack along Pacific Coast Highway. That sounds fun to me, really fun. I want to fish the L.A. River. Driven over it a couple times. I love Los Angeles. I think the fishing is just underrated there. And um, you go visit Kelsey, fish with her out there. I want to fish those carp in that cement, you know, where, where the Terminator jumps his, his Harley and he's driving through there where, uh, she's grease was filmed. There was a, a Rihanna video with TI. I just think that'd be really cool. And fishing that concrete waterway. That's got all these just random carp milling around. That's fascinating me for a long time. You know, right down the street where I grew up, there's Lake Throw. I haven't fished from a canoe in Lake Throw since I was in middle school. And I just I just haven't gotten around to throwing the canoe on the roof and, and going over there. Um, it's not that well fished area. It's, it's, there's no boat ramp. It's not like Audubon where all sorts of yahoos come in from out of town without their resting stickers. Yeah, it's just, just lakes. I want to fish some more bass lakes around here. I want to go up to Lapland and fish. We've got some friends from the Swedish embassy and her brother fishes up in Lapland and she shows me these pictures of pike and trout and got a client recently from Sweden and he was talking about all the crazy pike fishing out there. I want to go where uh, Carolus Linnaeus you know, did a lot of his work. And I see, I remembered his name this time. Last time, remember I had to look it up. I had a brain fart. I want to go in the footsteps of Linnaeus and, and walk through there and have lingonberries and, and not have to eat pickled herring and surstermang and other things. Maybe just a lot of meatballs and little pancakes. I want to head up there. I want to go see some reindeer, whatever else I can find. Now, here's one that I'm still kind of angry about. My cousins went to a wedding off the coast of Georgia when I was a freshman in college. And they said, you've got to go to the St. Simons Island. It's a wonderful place. It's where uh, JFK Jr. got married. It was the infancy of the internet. And I started looking it up and towards the halfway part of my senior year in college, I started thinking I had to find work. And through contacting little St. Simon's Island over months of talking about my biology degree, I think sending my transcripts down, letters from my professors and advisor, um, phone conversations. This is back, back when I had a... Uh, analog phone that had like the green number lights on it thing was huge and i would i remember being in burger king one day in fredericksburg waiting for the call to find out if i was going to get the job as a naturalist down there where i could teach people fly fishing and take them around the island showing them my love of nature and the diverse wildlife and biodiversity you can find on that barrier island and it, the it went from like a whole bunch of people to like five to two of us. And the other guy got the job specifically because he had once interned for a summer job where he 
counted sea turtles coming up on the beach at night. And I thought that sucked. I was all ready to pack up my Honda Accord and move down there in June of 1999. And I, I really was heartbroken. I thought this was going to be my my calling. Was this job down on the beaches, taking people around. And it, it fell through. And uh, I moved home for a couple months. Got that job at the Smithsonian. And then that failed. And uh, that's when I started working at Orvis. Back in 99. Still pissed I lost that job. When I was working at the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute, I was hired to be the liaison between the scientists in Barrow, Colorado Island in Panama and the Smithsonian offices in D.C. I was going to go down w- one week a month to Barrow, Colorado, to the, Carib- to, the, uh, to the Panamanian rainforest where all these organisms that I've been studying and love to see and wanted to learn more about and the people that study them, that would have been an awesome job too. But the budget for the government fell through. The art gallery got the money and I got laid off. It would have been awesome. Uh, I want to go back to Long Beach, California and fish the lagoons. This might have to be like a two part. I'm going to try and hurry this up. I got errands to run this. Uh, the Long Beach Lagoons. I, you know, I was fishing the inlet of one, and that's where I caught my first Corbina. These these lagoons just look so cool. I've only been there in the winter, and there's an In and Out Burger like right past them, which would make me terribly happy. I want to get my animal style, animal styled, well done fries. Oh, I'm hungry. I might have to go to Freddy's today for a sandwich. I want to fish those lagoons. They just look peaceful, calm water with little boats everywhere, and these little pretty houses along them and swimming areas roped off and little bridges, people driving around in golf carts. I was enamored with that place. I want to go back to Africa to fish the Medikwe river where I only had a seven foot five weight because my eight weight broke. And there were what I now believe to be Wells catfish in the river. There just hundreds of them stacked up like cordwood. They would eat chunks of bread. You throw in the water. Uh, I want to go back there. I want to throw a big bread fly in. And I want to land one. I want to go back and see. Never got to see African wild tigers. Um, Didn't really get to see too much of the hyenas. Warthogs are hilarious. And I want to see a leopard again. That leopard was the gnarliest animal I've ever seen. I want to do the Marquesas. Just always saw that on like the Saturday morning TV shows. Flip Pallet was going down there. Fell in love with that. Thought that'd be a great place. I want to fish near a hot spring out west in the winter, like in Wyoming. I've never been really out to Wyoming in the winter with all the snowmobiling and all the elk around and the bison covered in snow. Remember, folks, they're not buffalo. I don't know why Americans insist on calling them buffaloes. If it's buffalo bill or what, they're bison. Completely different animal. (sighs) I want to go up to northeast Maine, and I want to fish the stone cobble beaches. I hate sand. And this doesn't sound like a place where I'm going to get that awesome coconut curry with some coconut rice and some plantains and a cold lager beer. But I want to go up there and fish those cobbles where I don't have to worry about the um, sand getting all over and everything. Sand's up there with cilantro. It's it's the worst. And the wife can go get her lobster roll and and hang out with her friends. And my wife loves me, and that's where she used to – work in the summers. I know one of her campers was um, Tommy Matoli's daughter, Mariah Carey's ex-daughter-in-law. Now, I can't say it's Tommy Mattioli because he's our fly tire here in Virginia. Two different people. I want to go to the northern lakes across Canada and Minnesota, and I want to catch northern pike. I want to cast some big popping bugs, some big rabbit strips up against those reeds where those fish are chilling. Always wanted to do that. I want to go way up north where I can see the Aurora Borealis. Just the Aurora Borealis has been a bucket list. Now, we saw some slight ones on the Salmon River in 2004, I believe. But I want to see, like, the crazy ones. Like, where the whole sky is just moving. I, I've been wanting to see that since I – the first time I ever saw it on TV it was probably while watching Marty Stauffer's Wild America – and I need, to, I need to see if that's on Netflix. I need to start showing that to my kid. That was appointment TV for me growing up. 
I want to fish Nova Scotia. I want to fish the coastal waters there. Um, I want to, the wife and I to eat the bounty of just food up there. Um, the berries, the mussels, the game, um, like the root vegetables. Oh, we just want to go nuts up there. I want to fish the old growth bald cypress swamps. I mentioned that. I want to get back down to Ecuador. I want to do the Peruvian and Ecuadorian coast. The wife can get those ceviches. I want to go fish the tide pools down there. That uh, that cold upwelling current from the Anta- or from the uh, Antarctica. That ice cold water that's bringing the penguins and the sardines. I want to fish sardine patterns to things that eat sardines. Maybe from like a little panga. I want to go up to the Pacific Northwest. I want to go fish a temperate rainforest for steelhead. I want that moss hanging on the trees, on everything. I want to fish along those tide pools. I just want to see those tide pools at low tide where I can flip over rocks and find octopus and crabs and urchins and just all sorts of different echinoderms and different arthropods. And I think it would just be awesome. Crustaceans, fun stuff. There was um, Trout Unlimited TV back in the day with Tim Linehan. And he's still on my list to get on here. Once we, I think I've nailed down the podcasting over Skype. But Tim was floating this Pacific Northwest River for trout, and it was this greenish turquoise color, like aquamarine. And they were catching trout. There were these awesome caddis hatches, and damn, if that just didn't look awesome. And that was from an old wooden drift boat. But I want to go swing the Pacific Northwest. And just see these mossy covered trees and just old growth, just stuff that's been untouched. I don't care about vampires and all that crap. I just want to go up there and see the biodiversity. I want to fish a prairie pothole just out in the middle of nowhere where ducks are stopping off. I don't even know if there's fish in prairie potholes. But I did see a fly shop in Kansas when I was driving cross country. Maybe they could put me on one. Prairie potholes, super unique. They're... um, They're wetlands that migratory birds and organisms depend on for their migration. And I I, I would take Tom with me, but he'd probably shoot all the birds. Uh, But at least I'd have some good food that night. Prairie potholes. Pyramid Lakes always intrigued me. The whole ladder fishing for the Lahontan cutthroat. Um, Who doesn't want to do that? Just It's just a completely different way of fishing. I used to watch National Geographic Explorer on TBS on Sunday nights with... uh, Boyd something was his host and they went down to, I want to say, I didn't look it up to ever confirm this. I think it was Guatemala and it was the Rio Azul and people were kayaking down this river that it looked like if you had taken blue paint and turquoise paint brushes and put them in water and swirled it around with a dot of green. It just, it didn't look real. It looked like somebody had dyed this river, a, a aquamarine. Don't know if there's fish in there. I just want to go and see it. It was just so cool. Uh, I already mentioned rivers full of sockeye. I would love to see that. Um, Also, I've never seen a chum salmon. I think it would be awesome to catch them. Uh, What a cool looking fish. I've seen those pictures of them swimming across the roads when uh, the rivers flood and they go up. They're just those gnarly teeth and those purple vertical kind of look flame looking colors that come up the side of them. Scotland. Everyone wants, who doesn't want to go put on your, your tweed thrashka and have your thick sweater on and go out and fish for brown trout and salmon in Scotland and, and drink some whiskey at, by the fire at night and have a cigar and it'd be all cold and wet and dreary out. But then you look outside and, the hills are colors that you just can't paint in nature. All those different low-line uh, scrub that are, just look like a patchwork of tweed, which is, I guess, why they use tweed because it blends in out there. I've always wanted to do that. I think that would just be magical. Um, seeing old castles, having deep-fried pizza, deep-fried Mars bars, and scotch eggs. And, uh, damn, does that not sound like... One of the top five things on a bucket list. I want to go to Shark Bay in Western Australia to see the stromatolites, which is the oldest living thing in the world, and see if there's fish out there. I know the whale sharks go out that way. I just want to go to Western Australia. I want to do all of Australia, but Shark Bay 
just to see those crazy looking organisms. Um, I have Life on Earth by David Attenborough. That's where I first learned about them, this old hardback book. And they just look too cool. Something you have to see in your lifetime. Canadian smallmouth uh, pike, Canadian uh, brook trout are on the list. Uh, The wife really wants to go somewhere in the South Pacific where there's huts with glass bottoms over the water and hammocks over the water. I'm not going to argue with that. I'll go there with her. We had uh, Joe DeMaldaris on a couple months ago. He said that you can catch American shad on dry flies on the Delaware River. Boom. Bucket list. I wrote that one down right after we were done talking. Uh, I've always wanted to do the Space Coast in Florida for redfish and sea trout and and, uh, shad, whatever else is down there. One of the things I always wanted to do was see the space shuttle take off. That's not going to happen. My brother got to see it. But I want to go see those launch pads and just some of that old NASA stuff. Always wanted to fish the Space Coast. I want to fish a desert tailwater where it just... It doesn't belong. The whole idea of trout out there just doesn't belong. But you get like salmon fishing in the Yemen, kind of like that. I want to fish somewhere in the Pacific Southwest where I can get roasted hash chilies and all sorts of just – we've never done the the Southwest. So I want to eat all the chilies and green chili, red chili, tamales um, and fish maybe a tailwater down there that's got trout. One of the first fly fishing the worlds I ever saw was in Tasmania and they were fishing for trout and they were hiking across this field, going through fern forest, looking for brown trout and just said to myself, I have to do that one day. That was in college. We used to get up, put on MTV and then we'd watch fishing shows. MTV was like always on in college. It's where we got our news. It's where we got all of our culture from. But those Saturday morning shows were something else. And and I wish we still had them on. I don't get the fishing stations. Um, so my, my fishing TV show watching is, is pretty non-existent. But Tasmania, from that one episode. Uh, back to the Space Coast, I, I don't really know where St. Augustine is on the map. But the historical value of it sounds really cool to me. I've always wanted to go to St. Augustine. I want to do Thailand for giant snakeheads. There's some guys I follow on Instagram that just catch these ridiculously big fish on these just mouse, mouse looking things, um, lures, plugs. I want to go catch one of these white, black, and turquoise giant snakeheads. I want to go catch more northern snakeheads. Um, Florida, uh, I'll get to that next. Uh, Arctic Circle. I want to go up there. We had the. What was the orbit? Down the hatch last year, and constantly the uh, the Canadian guys list something. I want to say Le Chief, but that's the bad guy from Casino Royale. Uh, they're a group of Canadian dudes, and they're up there fishing in the middle of nowhere. They're not even in the water. They're just in waders and t-shirts uh, with their flat billed hats, casting out to like char and salmon in the middle of freaking nowhere. It just looked awesome. I would stop what I was doing and just turn my head when I heard the music on for that song. I would really like to go there. I could probably knock out the Aurora Borealis when I'm up there. And speaking of Thailand, I mean, my little wife wants to go there for food. Um, she wants to hit up Vietnam too. We have awesome Thai and Vietnamese food here, but wouldn't it be awesome if we could go there and get like the real deal? And speaking, when I, my errand today is going to the international grocery store. I need a bunch of stuff. I need some. Uh, of the instant vermicelli rice noodle hot and sour soup to eat up on the river next week. That stuff is legit. Tree Fern Forest mentioned that. So back to uh, Thailand, you ever seen the movie The Beach, The Turquoise Lagoon? They're all full of tourists now. They're supposed to be just awful places that are ruined, but find, you know, those old uh, sugarloaf haystack of, um, what do you call that? Limestone. That's just been eroded out. You've got these beautiful, clear, sandy bodies of water. That'd be an awesome place to go hang out. I've always wanted to fish Vancouver Island for sea run cuts and steelhead. Um, I know there's some very cool uh, farming that goes on up there. Um, Some exotic, you know, like wildflowers and just foraging you can do for food. I want to go back to Vancouver too. I mean, 
if we're going to break this down, it's going to be Pacific Northwest, Alaska, Florida. I think that would handle a lifetime of what I want to get done. I want to do Yellowstone and the Tetons. I was there when I was a kid. Didn't fish. I just remember seeing all these people fishing, thinking, damn, you know, I, I want to fly fish for them. My brother had a fly rod at the time. Didn't really know if I should have brought it with me. You know, looking back now, it, it would have been a dream come true. I want to do that now. I want to get an RV and just go out there for the summer and fish. I've got friends that do it. They're mostly retired or they're school teachers, but it's something I need to do. I, I loved that summer trip where we just went to dodgy motels and hotels and some pretty nice lodges and just spent an entire summer out in the Tetons. Moose, bear, elk, pikas, just such cool stuff. And I haven't seen a lot of that since I was out there. Uh, Milwaukee. I'm going to hit that up next summer. I'm going to go to uh, the Fly Fishers, and I'm going to buy a bunch of stuff there. I'm going to buy some original Pat Ellers flies. He's one of my big influences in tying. You could put him up there with Bill Skilton as like, and Dave Whitlock, the guys I look up to, and uh, French and Ward out west. These these are my icons, and I want to do the smallmouth that he was talking about. Now you can catch six pound smallmouth within a five minute drive from the shop, and go to the harbors and catch monster brown trout. That would just be awesome, and get like chili dogs and beer and uh, squeaky cheese. I think we'd have a great time. So we're definitely driving up there next summer. And I'm going to finish with the Miami Canals. Um, I, I've been obsessed with Miami since I was a kid. Um, there, there, I did mention this about Hawaii. Every TV show about Hawaii, except like Hawaii Five-0, I, I watched. There was uh, The Birds of Paradise with that obnoxious kid, Seth Green, I grew up with. Uh, there was North Shore. There was the Real World Hawaii uh, Wind on Water was a very brief show. Uh, Magnum PI. Uh, there's just the Hawaiian. I've, I've been obsessed with Hawaii my entire life, and I've been upset. And I didn't go there until I was married. But Florida, uh, growing up, was Miami Vice, and you know the opening shot with the flamingos. My grandparents living one set on the ocean, and my other grandma living inland. That I had the best of both worlds where. I would fish the ocean for salt water, and then the afternoon, we'd go over to my other grandma's, and I'd fish for largemouth in the canals. It's the diverse subtropical ecosystem down there. It's the bugs, the the reptiles, the amphibians. The, the, there's exotic fish from all over the world that you can catch there. Without, I don't have to go to the heart of Colombia to catch peacocks. I don't have to go to... Um, certain places to catch these crazy catfish. I believe there's Paku down there. There's all these crazy fish that I could catch on a fly within a, a day's drive. And it's warm and I can go get the uh, you know Caribbean food down there. I can go down and, and get all the Cuban food and um, the palm trees everywhere and places that are named after pompanos and flamingos and this lagoon and tarpons. And I, I love Florida and the wife is not a Florida person. She's a mountain person. So we'll do the road trip upper Midwest. We'll do one out in the great, the Rockies. And we're going to have to do a long one all the way through Florida to the keys, both coast central. I want to fish it all. I want to have an RV with a fly tying station and rods rigged up with a fly craft, maybe inflated on the roof. That's what I got to take next year with me. I need to buy a fly craft. That's it. That's what I want. That's my bucket list. Since I was a kid, if you fish these, let me know if I'm right or if I'm wrong. If you've been there, send me your your pictures. But um, until then, I got to go pack up. Now we're leaving in a couple of days, and uh, this fly tying office is a mess. And I'm going steelhead fishing, and that's all I can think about right now. Is steelhead. Halloween's done with. Steelhead on the brain. That's it. Thanks for downloading this 91st episode of me talking. Uh, Going to get some more interviews up over the winter. Jason, uh, do you want me to bring the bike rack with me 
this week or wait till we come up and have uh, a day together this winter? Let me know. It's a small bike rack. I think Holt will be able to fit in this car. He still insists on driving a Subaru. Uh, my car's bigger, and I don't care if, if someone spills a beer or a meatball sandwich in my car because it's easier to clean out than, than his car, Subarina. All right, folks. Um, there's so many places I didn't list, but you get the gist of my priorities in life. Let's finish this up. And uh, with my experience... You can say maybe I'm an old man, so uh, I'm going to take you out. This is going to be the new outro song to the podcast from Waitress to Musical. Let's take it from an old man. Take it from an old man. Time's just sand slipping past. We want to hold it in our hands. But no one ever sees What falls through the cracks Take it from an old man My mistakes have made me And I am what I am And though I don't believe in silver Take it from an old man Take it from an old man The days don't stretch any longer They've left tracks upon my skin But I reckon made me stronger But I believe there's something in you Something you should be seeing too Bet it all on yourself at least one time Cause honey, win or lose Thank you for joining us for the Fly Fishing Consultant Podcast. For more information or to contact Rob, please go to www.robsnowwhite.com strength of your own honey hold out your hands and take it from an old man this has been a production of freestone media at freestone-media.com